tonight we're turning to John 17, which uh, I hope that your own familiarity with the, with the scriptures would tell you instantly what that chapter contains. There are certain chapters of the Bible that are famous for being the supreme chapters on certain subjects. I mean, everybody knows what 1 Corinthians 13 is about. Uh, hopefully you know what 1 Corinthians 15 is about. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with Romans 8 or many other famous chapters. In John, John 17 is unique and stands out and should immediately ring a bell in that it is what most people call the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Now, it, there's no real mention of him being a high priest here, nor for that matter anywhere else in Scripture except in Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is the only book of the Bible that mentions Jesus being the high priest. That is, in fact, the unique contribution of that book to our Christology, that Jesus is the great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But although the term priestly or high priestly is not found in this book, we see Christ making intercession for his people uh, at length in this chapter. The entire chapter is devoted to his prayer. It is his final prayer for his disciples before his crucifixion, just as the previous chapters 13 through 16 were his final discourse to his disciples before his crucifixion. And so we don't know exactly where they are while he's praying. At the end of chapter 14, when they were in the upper room, Jesus said, Arise, let us go from here. And we have not committed to the issue of whether they left the room at that moment or started getting ready to leave, and he continued to talk through chapters 15 and 16. But uh, it's a good chance that he prayed this prayer as he was walking to Gethsemane with the disciples, though we don't know. It was certainly either in the upper room or on the way to Gethsemane. And Jesus spoke these words lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, the reference to the glory, glory that Jesus had before the world was is something that John has mentioned at the very beginning of the book. He has not really used the word glory in the opening words of the book. He said in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he talks about how in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Light and glory are definitely related concepts in Scripture. Glory often has the meaning of radiance. And so Jesus, before his incarnation, was the radiance, the light, that it says in John 1.9, enlightens every man that comes into the world. And then in John 1.14 it says, and the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So we can see the glory of Jesus existed before the world was in the form of God. But he was made flesh, and, and John said, well, we saw that glory. We beheld his glory. Uh, but it was not like a full-on uh, glory, like seeing God exactly straight on. It was more like seeing the image of a father in his son. In fact, that's how John 1.14 should read, although our translations say, we beheld his glory as of the glory of, a, of the only begotten of the father. The only begotten of the father. The, the words the, the definite article are not found in the Greek of that verse, and so it can be rendered the glory as of an only begotten of a father, which He's being more generic and saying just as uh, you can often see the likeness of a father in his own son. So we could see the likeness of the glory of God 
in looking at Jesus. No, nobody can see God and, and live. No one can see his glory full on and live. That's what God told Moses when Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. And God said, that can't happen. I can show you only the back parts. But uh, we, we got the, about the best revelation of the glory of God that men can see in Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, it says that Jesus is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So Jesus was as much the image of God as we could hope to see in this world. And he was the brightness of God's glory. Uh, and so that's the glory that actually was seen in him. But the glory that was not seen was the glory he had before. He was uh, veiled in a tabernacle of flesh. He was the glory of God before. And then he was tabernacled and, uh, and a veiled uh, of disclosure of God's glory was seen in him. As people saw Jesus, they saw the glory of God, but not as it had been. And he's praying that his glory that he had had before he came to earth will be restored to him. Now, I don't know exactly, and I don't know if anyone can know exactly, what that means with reference to his incarnation. Because there's some question as to the whether the incarnation changed Jesus eternally, permanently, or whether it was, in a sense, a, a more or less temporary situation, at least in some respects. His body that came out of the grave resurrected was a glorified body. And it would appear that Jesus retains that body. He still had the holes in his hands and his feet, so we know it's the same body, but it had taken on a glorified form. Uh, now, when he went into heaven, we don't know if he was, you know, as it were, reabsorbed into the Godhead or whether he remained, uh, you know, individual in a body. Of course, we have the imagery in, in the Bible of him sitting down at the right hand of God the Father. And the imagery is, of course, him sitting a little bit to the right of, uh, of his father on a decorated chair, a throne. But that imagery may be an accommodation to us. I don't know that God the Father has a body. He's a spirit. And I don't know whether, I don't know what the form Jesus is in, in heaven, is. Whether they sit on a chair or whether sitting on a throne is simply an image of sovereignty, an image of rulership. And, uh, and all we're really being told is that he went back to his father and uh, became, as it were, uh, one with his father in the sense that he had been before. He knew what that meant. The disciples listening and recording this couldn't possibly know. And even we who know more than they did at the moment because we now have received the Holy Spirit and they had not yet. And we have all the theology of the later epistles which they didn't have to read. Uh, yet we don't fully understand what it means that God restored to him the glory that he had before. And that is something that will perhaps at least permanently throughout this life, elude our comprehension and elude our ability to explain or analyze. But it is obvious that Jesus had finished his work on earth and was ready to reassume his former glory. And he's praying now that the Father will glorify him. Now Jesus was going to glorify the Father. And that's what he says in verse 1. Glorify your Son that your Son may also glorify you. Jesus didn't come to glorify himself. He came to honor and to glorify his Father. And he was going to now glorify his Father by uh, surrendering his life and, and being offered up as an atonement for sins. And then he would be glorified by the Father in his resurrection. Now, Jesus would not cease to glorify his Father after that because Jesus exists only to glorify his Father. That's all he wants to do. And... So the fact that Jesus wants only to glorify his Father is a strong argument that that's the right thing for any human being to do. Everyone should have that as the obsession to glorify God. When Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, the day will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, he says that will be to the glory of God the Father. In the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works, he said, and they will glorify your Father, which is in heaven. 
our works, our goal, uh, all that we hope to uh, accomplish is hopefully the same as what Jesus hoped to accomplish, that God would be glorified in him. And Jesus is glorified by the Father, and the Father is glorified by Jesus. As we will find later on in this prayer, he prays that we too will be glorified and that we will share in the glory. Because in verse 22 of this prayer, he says, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that we may be one just as uh, they may be one as we are one. And so in verse 24, he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. Uh, now, John said in John 1.14 that we beheld his glory. Uh, but here Jesus is praying that his disciples will behold his glory. Uh, and apparently he means in the unveiled form that we will see him in when we are with him, when we pass from this life and see him as he is, unveiled. Now, in verse 2, Jesus uh, Continuing the same sentence from verse 1, he says, As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Now there's a number of concepts here that are coming up that were brought up earlier in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 5, uh, In verse 26, John 5, 26, Jesus said, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted to the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment because he's the Son of Man. And in verse 21 of that same chapter, chapter 5, verse 21, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Now, God has given Jesus the authority that God himself has to give life to whoever he wants to. And that's what he says here in verse 2 of, of our present chapter. That you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many, uh, in John it says as many as he wishes, as Jesus wishes. Here it's as many as the Father has given him. Now, those that the Father has given him is a concept that we encountered back in chapter 6 a number of times. And it's a concept that has often been, I believe, misunderstood, sometimes just in order to fulfill a theological agenda, certain ideas are uh, imported into this. For example, in John chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Now, the, one that the, fathers, that the ones that the Father gives to him will come to him. As you well know, there are many whose theology would say, well, those that the Father has given him are those that uh, are on some kind of a list that was made before the beginning of the world, that God chose to save some and not others. And those that he chose to include in the register are those who are called the elect, the chosen ones, and that they are the ones that God has given him. So that the whole expression, those that, you, that God the Father has given me, is simply in the mind of some persons, uh, it, it, it imported into that concept is the idea that these are a set number of individuals that cannot be added to or subtracted from who before they were ever born were either, uh, well, these ones were allowed to be on the list to be saved and they are therefore given to God out of the world. However, in John 6, 37, there's reason to suggest that that could be understood differently because it says in 6, 37 of John, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And down in verse 45, at the end of verse 45, he says, Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now those that the Father gives to Jesus are the ones who had already heard from and learned from the Father. Now on what occasion had they done that? Well, they were Jews. These were faithful remnant people. These were people who were raised 
in the, the religion of Yahweh. And as uh, many Jews had in fact been faithful to Yahweh before Jesus came. They had heard from him and they had been obedient from, to, to him and, had and heard and learned. Remember in the previous chapter to this at the end of John 5, Jesus said to the Pharisees that they had not heard Moses. In fact, it would be Moses that would stand up and accuse them because they did not believe Moses. He says, for if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me. That is, in Israel there were those who were true believers, the faithful remnant. They did believe the law and the prophets. And Jesus said, well, if, they, if you believe Moses, you believe in me. Because those who already were disposed toward God favorably in Israel were the ones that God gave to Jesus. And they came to believe in Jesus. Not because they had been on a list somewhere, but because of where their hearts were at. They were people whose hearts were already, they were already believers in Yahweh. Believers in the earlier revelation given by Moses. Remember in Luke chapter 16, in the parable of the, or the story of Lazarus and the rich man, the, what is the main idea of that story? People draw all kinds of theology from it about hell and things like that, but actually the story has one primary uh, message, it would appear, and that is the last line. This man who had died unprepared to meet God, and he found himself in the flames of Hades, wished that he could go back and warn his brothers so that they, they had not yet died, and he didn't want them to die unprepared like he did and come to the same place. So he said, send Lazarus back to warn my brothers. And Abraham said to him, they have the law and the prophets. They're Jewish. They've got the scriptures. And the man said, yeah, yeah, but they don't believe the law and the prophets, but they'll believe if a man comes back from the dead. And Abraham said, if they don't believe in the law and the prophets, then they won't believe even if a man rises from the dead. In other words, the ones who already in Israel had rejected the law and the prophets who didn't believe, they also would reject Christ, well, even after he rises from the dead. Him rising from the dead would not impress those who already have rejected the revelation God had given earlier through the law and the prophets. So Jesus said to his opponents, if you had believed Moses, you would believe me. The people who came to Jesus were those who had previously had opportunity and used that opportunity to hear from and to learn from God through his word. And so in John 6 and uh, verse 45, Jesus said, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. That is, they have previously, the Jewish people who had already responded faithfully to what God had said earlier and had heard and learned from him. Now they were ready to, for the next step. The Father is going to turn them over to Jesus. They are the ones that the Father has given to him. And Jesus makes that point clearly in John 17, in the verse after the one we last read. Because in John 17, 6, Jesus said, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. These people that God gave to him, they were already God's people. They weren't the devil's people. They weren't the children of the devil, as many of the Jews were that Jesus spoke to in John 8, 44, and said, you're of your father, the devil. Those aren't the ones that God gave. God gave to Jesus the people who were already God's people. And what made them God's people? They were faithful. That's what makes anyone God's people, is being, having faith. And so these were the Jews who had faith before Jesus came. They were God's people already, and he gave them to Jesus. He just transferred those that were already faithful to God under the Old Covenant in that generation. He just transferred them to Christ's leadership and gave them to him to be his sheep. Now, we didn't say much yet about verse 3 or 4, and that's a very important thing to, to talk about. In verse 3, he said, This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, this first line, this is eternal life, that, can be taken two different ways. The way that I'm most accustomed to hearing it preached, and I suppose it's the way that I most naturally have taken it too, is that he's saying, this is eternal life that they know you, in other words, knowing you is how people have eternal life. 
that to know God is to have eternal life. Now, it's also possible for him to say, this is eternal life so that the re result will be that they will know you. It could go either way. This is eternal life so that, that is the life that I give to my people, it's eternal life so that they can know you. It could even imply in that case that knowing God is something that will take forever to learn all about. The depths of God, may be, they may take eternity to penetrate and to get to know him that thoroughly. But we'll have that much time because the life he gives is eternal life so that they may know him. You know, Paul said in Ephesians that through the endless ages, God will make known to his people what is, you know, the glory of his uh, inheritance to them and so forth. That... You know, we might think that once Jesus comes back, we'll suddenly know it all. I think that we're going to be learning more about the depths of God and of Christ throughout eternity. I think there's that much to know, that much to learn. And so Jesus might be saying, this life that I'm giving to those that you've given me, that life is eternal life so that they can know you and to know and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The idea being knowing him is the result of having uh, eternal life. Now the other way it's taken and more, more commonly taken is that eternal life is the result of knowing him. That is I have given them life and this life is in the form of knowing you Father. This is eternal life. This is the life I've given them. It, it can be defined as knowing you. Knowing God is eternal life. And so as many things in the Gospel of John are that Jesus said, they, they look like they can be taken two different ways. I think it's more common to take it this way, that knowing God it results in eternal life. And it would follow then that as you can know God by degrees, by to a greater or lesser degree of intimacy, so also the eternal life that is that consists in knowing him can be more intense or less intense, uh, more full or less full, uh, corresponding to your knowledge of him. Knowing God is something that is not, you know, you, first you, you're a non-Christian, then you come to Christ, and now you know God. Uh, well, you do. You do know him. But you have to keep knowing him more. That's what Christian life is. It's a relationship with God, which like any long-term relationship that you have with another person, results in deeper and deeper awareness of what makes that person tick. Greater and greater intimacy. More and more experiences shared together. Uh, a closer and closer friendship. And better and better acquaintance. That's, I mean, that's a relational love increases with time. And the increase is in, in depth. Now, the quality of our life with God, therefore, can increase with the increased quality of our knowledge of God. Remember what Paul said in Philippians chapter uh, uh, 3, I guess it was? He said that, uh, that I might know him. Let me, let me read that passage. I'm sure you know it, but it's interesting. Paul, who certainly knew Christ, in Philippians chapter 3... Uh, we could say, we could start at verse 7 and read through verse 10. He says, but what things were gained to me, he means the advantages he had by, in terms of his Jewish birth and education and, and religious accomplishments in the Jewish faith before his salvation. Those things that were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. He actually considers that they were more of a loss than a gain. Uh, why? Well, probably because he was so self-righteous. He, he was of a, a pure Jewish birth of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was, a, you know, a stickler for keeping the law. And like most of the Pharisees, he was proud of that. And so what may have seemed like a gain to his way of thinking was actually a detriment, a loss. And he says, I have counted it for the loss that it is. Why? For Christ, 
He says, but indeed I do count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Why? So that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Paul is a person who knows God, but he says, I have counted all that I knew before and all that I had before, I've counted that as dumb and as lost, so that I could know him and apparently continue to know him and, and know him even more through his, exhibit, his exhibition of his power, the power of his resurrection in my life, and also through the fellowship of suffering with him. Suffering with someone is a very deep kind of fellowship which bonds people, or at least potentially can bond people very much. In 2 Peter chapter 1, there's a number of things that Peter says about knowing God, and he's obviously not talking about intellectually knowing uh, theology. He's not talking about knowing the Bible. He's talking about knowing God. Many people know the Bible, and because they know the Bible, they assume they know God, because they know about God. They know theology. And it, it's a huge difference, on the one hand, to know a lot about God and be able to quote the theological uh, descriptions of God accurately and know all those big theological words about God's nature and character. But it's another thing to actually have a relationship where you know him, just as you might uh, you read uh, biographies of famous people and know about as much as you can know about them. I've read uh, five biographies of George Mueller. I've read probably three or four biographies of Sundar Singh. I really admire these men. I feel like I know a lot about them, but I've never met them. They were dead before I was born, and I've never really been able to have a chance to be acquainted with them. I feel like I know them, but of course they don't know me, because we've never met, and they've never read my biography. And so we don't have a relationship. I can benefit from knowing about them, I can be inspired by what I know, but knowing them personally would be an entirely different phenomenon. That they know what I'm going through, and they know how I think about things, and they know that we have a, sh a mutual knowledge. That kind of knowledge is different than just knowledge about. And so frequently, the word knowledge in Second Peter is epigenosis, which means a full knowledge. It's, it's talking about a, a something, a, a deep acquaintance, not, not just an intellectual apprehension of facts. And Peter addresses his second epistle in Second Peter 1. Uh, it says in verse 1, To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of epigenosis of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they may know you, the true, only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And Peter says, yes, I'm praying that you will have more grace, more peace multiplied, increased in your life in the context of your growing knowledge of God and of Jesus as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. That is, through this intimate acquaintance with him, all things come to us, all things necessary for life and godliness. He has given us, but through his divine power, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Now the divine nature, the, the character and the nature of God, imparted through the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, we partake of that through the knowledge of God that comes through the great revelation of his promises and so forth that he's given. And uh, not just, you know, reading the promises, but experiencing his faithfulness to keep his promises. Our re P. 
Peter's relationship with God was certainly not that of a theologian, a book-learning theologian. He was someone who had walked with Jesus, and then after Jesus left, the Holy Spirit came upon him and revealed things to him. He was on the rooftop at Joppa, uh, you know, he had visions of God. He had an ongoing, increasing knowledge of Jesus. And he said that by this comes the divine nature. By this comes to me all things necessary for life and godliness. By this grace and peace are multiplied to me. So there's a deepening of one's eternal life. There's a deepening of one's experience of God's life. And the divine nature that comes with greater knowledge of God and of Jesus. And this greater knowledge comes, as Jesus said, uh, as Paul said, in, in, as we saw in Philippians 3, 10, uh, that, that, we, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection, which would mean, I believe, uh, since he is, a, is resurrected and there's a newness of life, there's a new glorified, uh, new covenant kind of phenomenon of eternal life that comes through the resurrection of Christ, that resurrection life that we experience through re by being regenerated, and in the fellowship of his sufferings, means that as, as I suffer more with him, he and I fellowship in those sufferings all the more. It says in the Old Testament of God with Israel, it says, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. And, and Jesus said, as much as you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. If someone persecutes a Christian, they're persecuting Jesus, and he's going through it along with you. Going through those things and finding God close to you, finding God's comfort come to you in those times is an experience that deepens your actual knowledge of God. That is acquaintance knowledge with God. Deepens your intimate knowledge of God. Now, Jesus said, this is what eternal life is, that they might know God. And Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So knowing God is really not like knowing anyone else, because you can know any number of people, and it doesn't impart to you a different species of life. It doesn't impart to you a different a quality of life. Your quality of life can improve, perhaps by sitting under the right kind of professors in school and so forth and, and learning important things. Your quality of life can improve, but the species of life remains the same. It's not divine life. Eternal life is life from the eternal God. It is life in Christ, as we read in 1 John 5.11, where John said, uh, this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. And it says, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. So eternal life is what God has given to us, and that life is in Jesus. It is not a life that we would have otherwise. And if you have the Son, you have that life. If you don't, then you don't. So this is what Jesus came to give, that which enables us to share in his life, in his experiences, in, in intimate uh, our whole life becomes an intimate relationship with God. Which is why, of course, Christians are so fond of saying, evangelicals are fond of saying, Christianity is not a religion, but a relationship. And uh, I know that I grew up in a, a religious environment where that was a head nod, or, you know, you know, yeah, we all agree, Christianity is not a religion, but a relationship. But I think people who use those words often didn't uh, attach very, uh, maybe they didn't know what kind of meaning to attach to them. Because many of those people still had a religion. <laughs> and many who said they had a relationship with Jesus were simply using a cliché. It seemed evident that they didn't have a very committed relationship in some cases. They weren't obedient to him they, uh, in many cases. They said they had a relationship with him, but what kind of relationship? Knowing him as your Lord. Knowing him as the one whom you are fully submitted to and fully trusting. Like children do toward their father in best case scenarios, as wives do to their husband in best case scenarios. Uh, trusting completely, submitting to completely, uh, enjoying completely. Those uh, analogies of relationships, family relationships, are the ones that the Bible itself chooses to uh, be metaphors of our relationship with God. It, uh, it changes 
as we know him, we become fruitful in, the, in that eternal life which he gives. You know, uh, I'm sure you've noticed that when the Bible opens up in Genesis and starts talking about the intimate relations between a man and a woman, the word that's used is no. Adam knew his wife and she conceived. Or um, David had Abishag in his bed with him when he was an old man, but he never knew her. Uh, this euphemism of knowing in the Bible is frequently used of sexual intimacy. Why? You might wonder whether it's a different word for know. It is not. It's the ordinary word in the Hebrew language for knowing things and knowing people. It's not like a special form of that word. Rather, it is a picture of Christ in the church, of course, as Paul said. And when we know him, that's when he reproduces himself in us. The life of Christ is being reproduced in us. Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians 4.19, he said, Oh, my little children, with whom I travail again in birth until Christ is formed in you. Christ is being formed in us as a, as a baby is formed in the womb of a woman. As Christ was formed in the womb of Mary. It's an analog, an a analogy of what happens spiritually with us. He is formed in us. His life is reproduced in us. Um, and through the same means, the word comes and takes on flesh in us. So that this is the mystery of what Jesus came to bring. It's not a religion. It's a, it's a bizarre and unique experience with God. That isn't just a, a thing that takes place at conversion. It is the way we walk and live the rest of our lives. We're walking not alone. We're walking with him. And he is our guide. He's our Lord. He's our comforter. He's everything to us. Just as if we had a, an ordinary human friend there in those, that position. But much, obviously much better than what any, other, what any human could provide. That's knowing God. It is what eternal life is about. And he says in verse 4 of John 17, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus reached this point in his life just before his death and said, okay, there's really nothing else for me to do here. Except, of course, what he was just about to do. But it's interesting that there is at least one theological opinion out there that is widely held that Jesus didn't actually accomplish what he came to do. He came, they say, to establish the kingdom of God. But that effort was thwarted because the Jews did not agree to it. This is the dispensational position, of course, that Jesus intended to establish the kingdom of God at his first coming. But the Jews rejected him, and so it had to be postponed until his second coming. Therefore, they say the kingdom has not really been established. It will be when Jesus comes back, and it will be identified with the millennium. Because Jesus intended and offered and proclaimed that the kingdom of God was at hand and it was going to be established. But, sadly, he didn't find a cooperative Jewish people and therefore it didn't happen. Well, Jesus said, I have finished the work which you gave me to do. Did God give him the work of establishing the kingdom? Must have done it. Must have finished it. It wasn't aborted. It wasn't postponed. The project was not abandoned. He did the thing he was sent to do, and that was to establish the kingdom of God. So uh, it would be certainly a mistake to think that he had come planning to or hoping to establish the kingdom and failed. He does not indicate that he has had any failure whatsoever in accomplishing his mission. 